Palestine, hegemony, and survival. Our moderator is Amani Asunwar. Amani is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Istanbul Zaire University and a research associate at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs, SIGA, where she focuses on issues related to human rights. Amani received her master's degree in politics and international relations from the European Union Institute at Marmara University in Istanbul and previously served as regional director for the Euro Mediterranean Observatory for Human Rights. She's also contributed to several media projects, including to the Quds Chris News Agency and, and Golf Online. Her upcoming book focuses on the transformation of European foreign policy vis a vis Israel and the role of European elites. Please welcome with me Amani Sunwar. Thank you, Dr. Sami, and welcome all to the first session of our conference on Palestine. As Dr. Sami said, this session will be focusing on the tragedy of Palestine between hegemony and survival. And as you know, this conference takes place in a very critical time for the Palestinian cause and for the, our region at large, in fact. This session will be, give, uh, will be giving uh, a comprehensive introduction to the roots of this conflict, to the roots of the Israeli occupation. This occupation doesn't aim, in fact, only to seize land and resources, but rather it aims to dominate all over the region, outstretch its progress, democracy, and economic prosperity. Uh, let me now introduce our distinguished speakers for this session, and in fact, I'm so honored to do so. Let's start with Dr. Ilan Pate. Dr. Ilan Pate is the professor of history at the University of Exeter and the director of the European Center for Palestine Studies. Professor Pate obtained his BA degree from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and his PhD from the University of Oxford in 1984. His research focuses on the modern Middle East and in particular the history of Israel and Palestine. He has also written on multiculturalism, critical discourse analysis, and on power and knowledge in general. Professor Pape is the author of many books, including the bestseller, uh, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine and the Forgotten Palestinians. The title of Dr. Uh, Ilan Pape's presentation will be Israel from the Outside, Can an Apartheid State Ever Be Legitimate? Our second speaker is uh, Mr. Mandela Mandela, and Mr. Mandela Mandela is the chief of the Mpidu Traditional Council in South Africa, and himself is the grandson of Nelson Mandela. Uh, he's also a political activist, he graduated from Rhodes University in 2007 with a degree in political science, and he has been a member of parliament for the African National Congress since 2009. His presentation will be focusing on the great, great struggle for freedom, violence between South Africa and Palestine. And finally, we have Dr. Sami al -Ahian, and he's the director of the Center for Islam and Global Affairs, and also public affairs professors, uh, professor at Istanbul Sabah Din Zayin University. He received his PhD in computer engineering in 1986, and was a tenured academic in the United States for two decades. He founded numerous institutions and publications in the fields of education, research, religion, and interfaith, as well as civil, civil and human rights. In 2001, Dr. al uh, was named by Newsweek as the premier civil rights activist in the United States for his efforts to repeal the use of secret evidence in immigration courts in the United States. He was also profiled by historians in the Encyclopedia of American Dissidents as one of the only three Muslims in the United States out of 152 dissidents and prisoners, along with Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. His presentation will be focusing on the ending of the conflict from a geopolitical pers perspective. So welcome with, me, uh, welcome with me all our speakers in this session. So thank you so much. 
I just start with the Sharia. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a watch. I was looking for a watch. Can you give me time if I speak for 23 minutes? I remember correctly. 20 to 23. So give me time of 22 minutes. Good, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, uh, SIGA uh, for inviting me and the University of uh, Azaim for hosting us and for everyone who took uh, part in this uh, effort. Uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, to be amongst you and amongst such uh, a group of distinguished scholars and to be speaking in such an important venue uh, as this one and to thank particularly uh, Dr. Sami for making us all uh, feeling so welcome uh, uh, under his generous hospitality. Thank you very much. The question I was asked to answer is, can an apartheid state still be legitimate in the 21st century? And because I was honored with uh, giving the, the first lecture, in this uh, session, uh, I would uh, be uh, focusing on an historical context for that uh, uh, question. I'm not a legal expert, I'm not a sociologist, neither am I a political scientist. So whenever I see people sitting in rows, I cannot resist by giving a historical lecture. And uh, this uh, historical lecture, I think, uh, is very uh, relevant because we are still within the historical period I will be talking about. And in fact, the main problem with Israel, to my mind, is not only that it is an apartheid state, but it is a settler colonial state. Settler colonialism as a perspective through which we are looking at the state of Israel is not a new idea. But for some reason, when it was first introduced in the 1950s and the 1960s, it didn't seem very relevant. I think the reason was that the Palestinian liberation movement was still considering Zionism as a classical colonialist movement, and therefore thought that the classical analysis of Zionism as colonialism and as the, on, on the Palestinian struggle as an anti-colonialist struggle is the only perspective you needed in order to explain to yourself and to others why you are fighting Zionism and what you are fighting for when you fight Zionism. But years later, it turned out that says that colonialism is a fine-tuning on colonialism. It's a kind of a more refined version of colonialism and explains much better the Zionist movement and in many ways explains much better the challenges facing the Palestinian national movement in the 21st century, given the uh, achievements of Zionism so to speak, in Palestine in the last 72 years, or maybe even in the last 100 years. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what settler colonialism means, but I, if you would allow me, I just want to devote uh, two or three minutes to make sure that my definition of settler colonialism uh, fits your definition. It's a very important paradigm. And that particularly important paradigm, in, came, in fact, came through the work of academics uh, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, which doesn't happen often that the people who work in academia contribute so significantly to our discourse on Palestine. Usually the academics follow the activists, the political leaders, and so on. But in the case of settler colonialism, I think the group, especially group of young Palestinian academics uh, uh, contributed a lot to our uh, reframing of what the conflict is about and therefore, of course, what is the way forward in many ways. So settler colonialism is a movement 
of Europeans who were themselves victims of persecution. And we're looking for a new home, and one can say even a new homeland, because Europe did not want them anymore. They were expelled from Europe, and they were looking to rebuild Europe on someone else's homeland. And as the great scholar of uh, settler colonialism, Patrick Wolfe, says, in the encounter between this settler and the indigenous native population, the logic of the elimination of the native was activated. In fact, what is really similar to the movement of Europeans to North America, to Latin America, to South America, to Africa, to South Africa, and to Palestine, and one can include Australia and New Zealand in this, that the movement of these uh, 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 Europeans was a movement into a place where someone else already lived, someone else had already their own aspiration and their own progress, and that these people, the native indigenous people, formed the main obstacle for the success of a project that in the eyes of the settlers seem to be a project of salvation, of saving themselves from persecution in Europe. They had other problems. For instance, they needed usually an empire to help them uh, create a foothold in the new entities. And quite often, their interest and the interest of the empire that helped them to build the settlement clashed later on in history. And that's why when you talk about the war of independence in the United States, it's the war of independence against the British. And when you talk about the war of independence in Israel, it's the war of independence against Britain. And the Boers in South Africa would see themselves as fighting for independence in the late 19th century against the British Empire. The empires that helped them to colonize the indigenous people. Other processes take place when settlers come to someone else's homeland. And Zionism is a prime example of this. The settlers very quickly see themselves as the indigenous people. And in order to achieve this new identity as indigenous, they de-indigenize the native people. They take over their history, they take over their land, but they take over their history, Sometimes they take over their customs, their dress, their uh, memory, and they use it in order to eliminate the indigenous population. I mean, nobody went as far as the United States to, to call a, a weapon of mass destruction in the name of a Native American uh, tribe, the Apache. But uh, this is just symbolic to the way this uh, erasure of memory, of presence, of existence of the indigenous is an important part of the settler colonial project of taking over. And once you accept that this is the paradigm for Zionism, that this explains much better than any other paradigm we used in the past to explain Zionism, you can see how the history of Zionism unfolds in Palestine as a settler colonial project, as an incomplete settler colonial project, as a settler colonial project that is both successful, but also has not achieved everything it wants it to, and how this incompletion informs every act that Israel performs today against the Palestinian, whether it's an individual act of destroying a house or a village, or denying the Palestinian rights on a, uh, on a legitimate level, on a legal level, like the Israeli nationality law of December 2018. And in many ways, the Palestinian concept of the ongoing Nakba, a Nakba Mustamira, is really relevant to settler colonialism, because one of the things we teach when we talk about settler colonialism is that settler colonialism, this act of taking from the indigenous native people their homeland and claiming that it belongs to you in the name of God, in the name of Marx, in the name of nationalism, doesn't matter in what name, 
right? That this act is a structure, not an event. It doesn't happen in one year and it's over. If it's incomplete, it goes on and on. Either until the native disappears, or as happened in South Africa, if the settler colonial regime is defeated. The settler colonial regime in Palestine is not being defeated, but the native population of Palestine has not disappeared. And therefore, we have a very clear notion of the kind of struggle that we are involved in. The early Zionist uh, settlers who came in the late 19th century, I would say until the 1930s, were not preoccupied with the elimination of the native. They were preoccupied with building a base, an infrastructure. But once they had a sense of security because of the British Empire, because of the relative numbers that they succeeded in attracting to Palestine, once they had that kind of sense of orientation, they were engage with the question of how to translate what Patrick Wolf calls the logic of the elimination of the native into a strategy and into a policy. In fact, already in the 1920s, by studying carefully the land laws of the Ottoman Empire and the land laws of mandatory Palestine, the Zionist movement began to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from areas such as Marsh ibn Amr and Wadi Hawaris in the 1920s using the legal mandatory system and the legal, uh, uh, and the legal Ottoman system in order to begin on a very small scale to see whether they can fulfill or achieve the two most important dimensions for every settler colonial movement. All settler colonial movements are where and are engaged with territory and population, demography and geography. And whenever you take more of the territory, whenever you take more of the space, wherever you control more of the geography, you get more population. You get more demography or more demographic problems. And from the very beginning, the Zionist movement understood what most settler colonial movements understood. That taking the space is far easier than solving the demographic problem. When the Zionist movement or the Jewish community in Palestine was only one third of the population, it was able to take over 78% of the Palestinian homeland. But it was not able to solve the demographic issue as it wished to, although, as we know, they did succeed in expelling half of Palestine's uh, population in 1948. But this, this, this kind of balance between having the land without having the people who live on the land is something that really guides the Zionist movement from 1936 onwards and is at the heart of the Israeli strategy of 2019. It's the same ideology, it's the same conundrum, it's the same problem uh, that uh, has an international dimension to it, certainly. Can we justify taking over of land and getting, over, getting rid of people within the changing circumstances of the international law and international legitimacy. It's definitely something the Zionist leaders later, the Israeli leaders, were asking themselves. But they never question their right to do it. What they always question is, can we do it without paying the price of becoming, for example, a pariah state like apartheid South Africa became uh, in the 70s and the 1980s. So there is no worry, there is no apprehension, there is no concern within the Israeli Jewish community about the validity of the need to take as much territory as possible and getting rid of as many indigenous native people as possible. That was never questioned of, by anyone who was within the Zionist ideological framework. 
What is constantly questioned and constantly debated in Israel are the tactics. Or how far can you do it without uh, incurring the international wrath or international condemnation? Do we care about the international condemn condemnation? And what is so interesting about the Israeli uh, uh, dealing with this issue is that the Israeli electorate, this is the Israeli Jewish electorate, begins its history by saying, we care about the international community. We care about our image. So we should be very clever with the way we do it. We can do it during a war, like in 1948. And if there is no war, we should do it more incrementally, not massively. We should find legal systems that justify what we do. We should sell it to the world, not as ethnic cleansing, but as a peace process or as a tactical, temporary uh, measure uh, because there's no one to talk to on the Palestinian side or because there is Palestinian terror and so on. What is so interesting about the Israeli Jewish electorate since 2000, the message that comes from this electorate, no, we don't need to play the game anymore because we have proven that there is no need to justify what we are doing. We never paid a price. So why should... Why are we bothering? That's the message of what we call the right wing in Israel. Why, which is the most popular uh, political force in Israel. Why are we bothering with something which A, is not true, B, gets us into trouble, because the moment people compare the reality on the ground to the propaganda, they can see that the propaganda does not justify what we are doing. Why are we not saying properly that this land from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean is ours, that the people who live in this, the only indigenous people living there are the Jews, and yes, the other people can be tolerated, or they can leave, or they can be enclaved in small Bantu stands, but we don't have to bother anymore. And if you look at the Israeli nationality law of December 2018, this is the message of this law. The message of this law is, it's also self-criticism on what one can call the liberal Zionists for trying to square a circle which was impossible. You know, Albert Mami, Albert Mami used to talk about the leftist colonizers. He used to call them the leftist colonizers. The people who are not questioning the colonization, but really want to feel much better with it. And they want the colonization to adhere to international law or humanitarian uh, uh, or humanitarian or human or universal uh, uh, principles, and Albert Ami said always, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You are part of the same ideological framework, and actually, what you do, you provide the umbrella, you provide the immunity for the colonization to continue because you claim that you can beautify. You claim that you can provide moral justification for it. And the Israeli Jewish electorate said, we don't need it anymore. The first time in Israel's history, the number of anti-Zionist members of Knesset and liberal Zionist members of Knesset is the same. Ten. I don't know if you notice it. Meretz and uh, 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 the Labour Party have ten members of Knesset, I think, together. The Arab parties have 10 members of Knesset together. That's it. That's it. The rest is hardcore settler colonial Zionism that doesn't play the game anymore and deals with the main conundrum that was created by uh, the various achievements and failure of the Zionist movement since 1948. The achievement in 1948 was taking, as I said, almost 80% of the land, getting rid of half of the people who live there, finding a certain way of dealing with the remaining Palestinians inside Israel by imposing on them military rule. In 67, the geographical dimension of the settler colonial movement was achieved, 100% of historical Palestine became the, the state of Israel, if you want. And with it, inevitably, a new demographic problem 
emerged for the Jewish state. You picked up one million Palestinians, but you incorporated another million and a half to two million Palestinians. And since 1967, there, I, there were two schools of thought in Israel, and one of them won the day. One school of thought said, I can call it the liberal Zionist one, we will find a way of playing between the uh, geographical dimension and the demographic dimension. Uh, we will, and I think that's when they invented their version of the two-state solution. For them, for the liberal Zionists, the two-state solution and partition, and partition, is the liberal Zionist idea of how to solve this balance between demography and geography. You enclave the Palestinians in something that you will call a state with the hope that this idea of uh, sovereignty, which will not be in reality a sovereignty, would somehow exclude the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip from the demographic balance. And therefore you could go on controlling the land without calculating the people who live there as part of your own problem. And that didn't work as we know, it failed in Oslo. And now the Israeli uh, uh, point of view is very clear. Uh, we don't need to play these games anymore. Now what we need is a mechanism by which in the demographic reality of 2019 Palestine, of six million Jews and six million Palestinians living between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, what we need is to continue a matrix of power that enable us to control the demographic reality in a way that does not endanger our geographical achievements. And in 2019, we can say that there's already a third generation of Israeli Jews. I, I don't have an exact number, but I was trying to assess how many Israeli Jews are engaged in the oppression of the Palestinians in all forms and mechanisms. Because it's, it's not an easy task to oppress millions of people for such a long time. To my calculation, about 150,000 to 170,000, that's what, we, what you need, 150,000 Israeli Jews are engaged directly and make a living directly from controlling the Palestinians wherever they are in Palestine, whether they are in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in the Nakab, in the Galilee. This is uh, uh, an apparatus that uh, is uh, helped by the Israeli Academia that produces the graduates to uh, operate this uh, uh, mechanism which has a legal division, it has a security division, it has an economic division. It, it operates in all walks of life in order to, to make sure that this kind of uh, uh, maintain, maintaining the oppression uh, 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 succeeds. And uh, there is no desire whatsoever, we can see it, there's no desire whatsoever to change this way of life. I would always say this is now the DNA of the Israeli Jewish society. There's no need to change this uh, way of life, definitely given the development in the United States with a far more friendly American president, the way that the international community uh, uh, develops uh, through its political elites do not uh, require any dramatic change in the Israeli strategy. The only problem, and with this I will finish, the only problem, and we should strive from Istanbul to make it even a worse problem for Israel because that's the only thing we can do. The only problem they have is that the civil society around the world, not governments, but civil societies around the world know exactly how this apparatus operates, either saw it with their own eyes or know enough through the age of internet how it works, find it totally unacceptable, think that this legitimizes Israel and makes it a pariah state, and are doing all they can through uh, activities such as the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement to send a clear message to Israel that this reality that most Israeli Jews think is natural, moral, accept, morally acceptable, and 
politically and militarily feasible that there is a pet price if they continue to subscribe to it. Uh, the Israelis created a special ministry to fight against the civil societies of the world that know the reality and doing all they can to send a message to Israel that there is a price tag. They find out that they cannot use F-16s and tanks against civil societies around the world so that they could change their opinions. They cannot buy people with money and they cannot intimidate them through uh, projects of fear. And this is the only thing that is now working from the outside. And if we will be lucky, and in the next 10 years we will see a united Palestinian liberation movement with a clear vision for the future, this powerful energy from the outside will be translated into a transformative process in the inside. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Program Director. Let me uh, first and foremost uh, thank uh, Siga, Dr. Sami, and all uh, the staff at Istanbul Zion uh, University for a warm welcome the Rembrandt for being our host uh, on this uh, uh, wonderful uh, conference that we're having on Palestine. Respected members of academia, distinguished conference delegates, dear guests, and friends. The 21st of April today in our country marks a great milestone in South Africa's long walk to freedom. On this day, 25 years ago, the 27th of April in 1994, our global icon and father of our nation, icon for human rights, justice and peace, His Excellency President Nelson Polita Kamande joined millions of South Africans to cast their first ballot in a free and democratic South African elections. It was a momentous occasion as we cast off the shackles of 350 years of colonialism and decades of a brutal apartheid rule. That victorious moment was a celebration of the sacrifices of many generations of women, men, children who collectively contributed to our glorious struggle for freedom. Some paid for that freedom with their dear lives. I want to pause in this moment to honor all of them and also to honor all the global anti-apartheid movement in every city and every village of the world. Your voices in our darkest hours kept the flames of hope and the dreams of freedom burning brightly when our own leadership were incarcerated by the apartheid regime in jails like Robben Island, Paulsmo Prison, of which it is where I met my grandfather for the first time, and Victor Vester Prison. And our liberation movement was banned and classed as terrorists. Therefore, I, pro I proceed, Program Director, allow me to also pay tribute to the six million Palestinian refugees who have been denied the right of return to the land of their birth. There is no parallel for this in our South African struggle. For freedom, at least not on this scale. During the 1948 Palestinian War, around 720 thousand Palestinians who were forced out of 900,000 Palestinians who lived in the territories that became occupied Palestine and some would rather use 
the latter being the apartheid state of Israel, who fled and were expelled from their homes. Distinguished guests, delegates, and members of the academia, it is fortuitous that in this week that we celebrate Freedom Day in South Africa, a group of young people from Khan, Yunis in Gaza came to participate in a football tournament in Cape Town. They received a hero's welcome when they arrived at Cape Town International Airport. It reminded me of President Nelson Polita Mandela's words when he visited Gaza in 1995, saying, I quote, our freedom is yet incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people, close quote. My topic today, the great struggle for freedom, parallels between South Africa and Palestine, is therefore neither academic nor a matter that we take lightly, but rather one that is rooted in the experience of struggle, pain, and trauma. Madiba, after designating the struggle for freedom in Palestine, as intimidatingly linked by an umbilical cord to our own freedom, described the Palestinian struggle as the greatest moral issue of our time. Yet the world remains silent. My approach to this topic therefore looks at the parameters of our two great struggles for freedom, briefly reflecting on the context of the struggle and then proceeds to look some key parallels by exploring in Tahilia the legal, geopolitical, ideological, and historical elements. Our own struggle for freedom in South Africa was rooted in our opposition to colonization and imperialism. Days after his release in February 1990, Nelson Mandela met with Comrade President Yasser Arafat in Lusaka, Zambia, and said the following, I quote, I believe that there are many similarities between our struggle and that of the PLO, stating, we live under a unique form of colonialism in South Africa as well as in Israel, and a lot flows from that, close quote. It is easy to forget that much of our struggles for freedom and the liberation was waged in the Cold War era. The apartheid regime in South Africa was supported by Western governments, especially the United States of America and the United Kingdom. They not only played a pivotal role in equipping the brutal apartheid regime, but the USA in particular provided the intelligence as led by the CIA that led to my grandfather's arrest in 1962. Today, that inquisitious relationship is perpetuated in the United States unilaterally in supporting the apartheid state of Israel and its, of its condonation of the most horrific genocide and ethnic cleansing. Addressing the Afro-Arab Solidarity Conference in Luanda, Angola on the 6th of December 1961, the ANC president, O.R. Tambo, reminded us that, I quote, our destinies lie together. However difficult it may be, the conference has had the responsibility to ensure that in the future, when the people of Palestine are under attack, those of South Africa do not stand idle by." Close quote. No political discussion about the parallels between our struggles can escape this harsh reality. In the case of Palestine, the continued occupation and belligerent expansion of illegal settlements, the plight of six million refugees in the Palestinian diaspora, the thousands of political prisoners languishing in apartheid Israeli jails, including women and children, the imperialist attempt to annex the eternal capital Al-Quds, and the daily humiliation and indignity meted out 
to Palestinians at border crossing and checkpoints, which I witnessed on my visit to Palestine. On November 30th in 1973, the United Nations General Assembly opened for signature and ratification of the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crimes of Apartheid. It defined the crime of apartheid as inhumane acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. By this definition, Israel is an apartheid state and the argument uh, may well be made for classification of an even harsher nature commensurate with the nature of crimes. One only has to view the shrinking map of Palestine to understand what I mean. Only last week we read of more than 4,000 new approvals of separate developments in East Jerusalem have been passed. How many such applications have been approved for Palestinians' application? No prize are offered for guessing that answer. Absolutely zero. Israel is, in actual fact, an apartheid state. I first visited occupied Palestine in November of 2017. My first impression was that what I saw and observed was worse than anything I had ever experienced in apartheid South Africa. I was not alone in making such an observation. Before my first visit, great leaders of the anti-apartheid struggle, like Ahmed Katrada, Desmond Tutu, and the former Minister of Defense, as well as the Minister of Intelligence, Comrade Ronnie Castles, had expressed the same sentiments. Countless delegations of our own trade unions in South Africa, NGOs, and religious bodies had likewise visited and came to the very same conclusion that I had come to, that Israel was indeed an apartheid state. One of the participants who visited the West Bank as part of his trip, Mondri Makanya, then editor-in-chief of Sunday Times of South Africa, told a veteran Israeli reporter, Gideon Levy, I quote, when you observe from afar, you know that things are bad, but you do not know just how bad they are. Nothing can prepare you for the evil we have seen here. In certain sense, it is worse, worse, and I mean worse than anything and everything we endured in South Africa. The level of apartheid, the racism, and the brutality are worse than any West period of apartheid in the Republic of South Africa. Another participant in a trip, Nozizwe Maldala Rotle, a member of the South African Parliament who had been imprisoned during the apartheid era in South Africa for her opposition to the apartheid regime, said the following, I quote, it is hard for me to describe what I am feeling. What I have seen here, is worse than what I ever experienced. The absolute control of people's lives, the lack of freedom of movement, the army's presence everywhere, the total separation, and the extensive destruction we saw is inhumane, close quote. The parallels persist, but are not limited to this. It extends to the incarceration of political leaders detention of minors, torture and abuse of political prisoners, lack of basic political freedoms, constraints of freedom of movement, and the ever-present shadows of the state's secret service Mossad, crying into every aspect of the personal and political life of activists, much like the South African apartheid regime of the old. Like apartheid South Africa of the old, left no stone unturned 
to destabilize the frontline states, the apartheid Israeli regime, his fingerprints are on virtually every effort to destabilize the Middle East region. We believe too, like that of apartheid South Africa, apartheid Israel has its date with destiny and that will finally end all parallels. Prior to his arrest in 1962, my grandfather Nelson Mandel undertook a trip to 16 countries in Africa, including Egypt, Eritrea, Algeria, where he received his military training. But more importantly, it was to mobilize for support for our struggle for liberation. During his trip, he flew twice to the United Kingdom to meet with cadres in exile and mobilize them. I want to therefore urge the Palestinians living in exile to follow this example. Madiba and the South Africans living in exile became ambassadors for our struggle. We therefore call on Palestinians to do likewise and show that you are ambassadors of your struggle for liberation, of your struggle for self-determination, and ensure that you become the voice as the oppressed. One of the greatest pillars of our struggle was the fact that South African cadres in exile mobilized extensively, sometimes under difficult circumstances. Comrade Dalsi September was assassinated on the streets of Paris. Others were maimed and injured in letter bombs. However, nothing could ever deter the global anti-apartheid movement from growing in strength and tightening the nose around the neck of the apartheid regime and isolating it in the international community. We must use every opportunity to make the Palestinian struggle visible and intensify our protest campaign against apartheid Israel. The work of BDS has to be applauded in this respect in setting us on the right trajectory. My grandfather put three conditions for starting the negotiations to a peaceful transition in South Africa. And then all political parties release all political prisoners and guarantee the right of return of all South Africans living in exile. We must not make life comfortable for the apartheid Israeli regime as long as it continues perpetuating apartheid in its worst form. We must draw on the parallels of the South African experience where harbor workers in the US and in the UK refused to offload apartheid South Africa's press produce. We must boycott every product coming out of apartheid Israel, whether it is in fresh produce or in arms. We must rally the world for a complete arms embargo against apartheid Israel. My deliberation on parallels between our struggle will be incomplete without an appeal for unity. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to ordinary women and men all over the world, and especially the activists of the global anti-apartheid movement whose unrelenting efforts contributed immensely to the isolation of the apartheid regime in South Africa. If indeed it was possible, my grandfather and our entire nation would have thanked them individually and collectively. So to all of you present here today and those that are not present, whatever your contribution may have been, we profusely thank you and shall remain internally indebted to you all. That unity was also evident across political formations in South Africa in the way the, the internal forces were mobilized in the mass democratic movement. And the emergence of the United Democratic Front 
that brought together all religions, faith formations, workers, business, students, academics, and from every conceivable realm of society. This is an important lesson which our brothers and sisters in the struggle for Palestine would do well to heed. The call to unity in the South African struggle is a parallel to be replicated and lessons to be learned. We must intensify our efforts in the unification process internally and externally. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, let me finally uh, uh, let me uh, let me end with a final parallel between our two just struggles. Be that like apartheid South Africa, apartheid Israel has its date with destiny. We must lobby the Sadiq region, the African continent, and all allies in the non-ally movement and the larger global community to support the boycott and isolation of apartheid Israel until justice, peace, and human rights prevail. Madiba reminded us that I quote, peace, prosperity, and security are possible if only they are enjoyed by all without discrimination. Close quote. Finally, President Mandela reminded us that, I quote, it behoves all South Africans, themselves elsewhere beneficiaries of generous international support to stand up and be accounted among those contributing actively to the cause of freedom and justice, close quote. It was important for South Africans to add our own voice to the universal call for all Palestinian and Palestinian self-determination and statehood. Because we knew too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Without the resolution of conflicts in East Timor, the Sudan, and other parts of the world. We therefore are happy to add our voice in this conference Dr. Sami and Sita, and particularly the Istanbul Zain University, that as South Africans, we will stand side by side with the oppressed Palestinian nation until freedom is realized. I thank you. My presentation today is titled The End of the Palestinian Israeli Conflict, a geopolitical analysis understanding the epistemological and strategic imperatives of the Zionist project. The two remarkable speeches we heard this morning, or this afternoon rather, made my uh, presentation really much easy. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is to answer these four questions. What is the genesis of the conflict? What's the problem? Is the Zionist state the solution? What are the Israeli strategic imperatives that sustain the Zionist project? And finally, what are the most likely end of conflict scenarios? For centuries, the world witnessed two Jewish communities. The Jews of Islam, as Bernard Lewis and Ismail Faruqi would call them, and the Jews of Christendom, that is, those who live in the Christian West and Russia. Ever since the constitution of Medina in the first year of the Islamic calendar, 
Jewish communities and tribes in Arabia were recognized as intrinsic part of the Ummah, or the community. For centuries, therefore, Jews lived in peace and security with Muslims and other faith communities throughout, throughout the Arab and Muslim world, creating what Jewish encyclopedia calls the Jewish Golden Age, where Jewish philosophy, culture, and scholarship thrive. According to Lewis, the Jewish people were allowed to practice their religion and live according to the laws and scriptures of their community. He describes the regulations under which the Jewish communities were subjected, where he says they were social and symbolic rather than tangible and practical in character. That is to say, these regulations serve to define the relationship between the two communities and not to oppress the Jewish population. On the other hand, Jewish communities in Europe lived for centuries in ghettos, where they were discriminated against, ostracized, marginalized, and barely tolerated. The list of the social, legal, and religious incapacities and vulnerabilities is long, where every new Christian ruler would add to it. Unless the Jewish communities lived in their own ghettos, they may not employ Christians, they may not disinherit their ch uh, children who will convert to Christianity. They must not, they must convert, rather, if they marry a Christian. They shall be ruled by Roman law rather than Torahic uh, law. They shall not criticize Christian doctrines nor give evidence against Christians. They shall not celebrate Jewish feasts, practice circumcision, or refrain from eating pork. They shall submit to baptism, refrain from practicing their customs, punished if they work on Sundays, and they shall not appear in public during certain Christian holidays. They shall not work in agriculture or hold public office or offices, uh, or offices nor practice medicine on Christians. In short, European Jews lived in such miserable conditions that they were practically forced to live in their own closed communities in order to escape these harsh realities. Furthermore, it is incontestable that the modern history of European or Western Jews is intertwined with European modern history. So as the irrational age of European enlightenment dawned in the 17th and 18th century, when intellectual life was animated and where science and culture blossomed, while church dogma gave way to reason, it was then that the European Jew, who existed for centuries on sufferance, was finally emancipated. As they came out of their ghettos, they had to learn the vernacular the language of the land and adopt it as their own as they became a culture. Within decades, many Jewish generations were assimilated. Even many religious leaders or rabbis adopted new interpretations of the scripture and established different Jewish religious traditions, such as Reform Judaism that we see today in the United States, since religious freedom was guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. But despite liberty, egalite, fraternity, the assimilated and secular Jews still had to endure hatred, suspicion, and discrimination. As Theodore Herzl had witnessed firsthand as a journalist when he covered the Alfred Dreyfus affair in Paris in 1894. But despite the Enlightenment ideas that proliferated throughout Europe, with the exception of Russia, where they, had, where they didn't take root, the 19th century was the age of rampant nationalism and romanticism in Europe. So the lesson learned by this agnostic Jew turned rampant Zionist was that Jews would never be accepted or live safely anywhere. It was this manifestly anti-Jewish attitude by racist Europe that convinced the early Zionists that Europe would not tolerate its Jews. This experience had set them on their quest to adopt an ideology, political Zionism, by a certain Jewish nationalism, with all the diseases and fault lines of ethnocentrism, invented practically a new religion to emancipate the Jews from what they perceived as the incurable disease of anti-Semitism. It was a completely European experience. 
fueled by discriminatory and dangerous practices such as the Russian pogroms. These experiences had no equivalent for the Jews who lived within the Muslim world. In fact, when the Jews were expelled from Spain in the 15th century, they settled across the Muslim world, including in North Africa and even in Palestine, as well as in Istanbul, the seat of the caliphate. The tragedy of Palestine is therefore a direct consequence of intolerable Europe, including Russia, directing their racism and xenophobia against their Jews. But what would make this far-fetched Zionist fantasy a reality was a calculating colonialist scheme hatched in London to ensure not only the permanent incapacitation of the Ottoman Empire, but also the pertinent fragmentation of the Arab world in particular and the Muslim world in general. The Balfour Declaration of 1917 was born out of this unholy alliance between the Zionist movement and its colonial benefactors without any regard to the indigenous people of the land or the impact on the people of the region. For over a century, the Zionist movement adopted an aggressive and belligerent program for the purpose of establishing an exclusive Jewish state in Palestine. This dangerous movement and the state it created were guided by many strategic imperatives that must be totally understood and comprehended if we are ever to be able to confront the destruction it has brought, the suffering it unleashed, and the threat it exposed not only to the Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims, but also to the Jews around the world and indeed to the entire world. I will argue today that in order to achieve peace not only in Palestine and the region, but also for the entire humanity, political Zionism, the political Zionism movement and its project in Palestine must be confronted and defeated and all its institutions must be dismantled and disbanded. Note that I'm differentiating between the Zionist institutions and the Jewish people. They are not the same. Our quest must also be to save the true essence of Jewish culture and Jewish life from the dangerous Zionist path towards destruction. I may get this to work again. All right, so what I will do now is to <clears throat> present what I consider the strategic imperatives of Zionism and the state of Israel. That's what sustains the state. The first one is exclusivism. In this imperative, Zionism calls for the ingathering of all or most Jews around the world in the historic land of Palestine. Here's a couple of quotes from Theodor Herzl all the way to Benjamin Netanyahu, that this is an exclusivist state. That's the essence of what this project is about. Here is some statistics about populations in Palestine from 1800 over the uh, almost 200 years. <coughs> in 1800, Muslims and Christians were about 90%, 97.5%. The Jewish population was 2.5%. These are normally what people would live there as neighbors, as friends. When my grandfather, was born around 1892, that figure was still within 90%, 92%. When the British mandate took place in 1920, there was a census in 1922, and you could see what happened with the immigration that was facilitated by Britain. The number was 11%. By the time the state was created with this massive immigration, illegal immigration, I might add, the Roughly, the numbers were two to one. But if you add, even after all the occupation and the confiscation, at the end, I don't have time to go through all these statistics, you could see that when we add the occupied people in the West Bank and Gaza, today, as Professor Tape has mentioned, they are roughly the same. Even the Palestinians exceeded the Jews inside Palestine. So in that level, even that project has not succeeded. And it's uh, unlikely that it will succeed by ethnically cleansing Palestinians again. The second imperative is exclusion. 
In this imperative, Zionism calls for the expulsion, exile, or banishment of as many Palestinians from historic Palestine as possible. And as I said, this is <coughs> it's going to be much more difficult this time around. But when we look at what happened in 48, and Professor Abu Sitta will be with us today. He wrote the whole Atlas of Palestine, and he shows all the different villages that have been ethnically cleansed, as well as Professor Tarpey, over 500 of them. This is historic Palestine. Most of these villages and towns were erased. And here a couple quotes from Bingorian and Jaktunsky, the two leaders of the two strands of Zionism, both calling for the expulsion of Arabs from Palestine. The third strategic imperative of the state is expansion and colonization. This is Israel's manifest destiny when you compare it to the U.S. In this one, Zionism calls for the gradual expansion of the Zionist state by seizing as much land as they possibly can. And you could see in this famous map, when at the beginning of the 1947 or so, with all the different tactics that they used during the British mandate to seize as much Arab land, and again, there are all these are documented, the actual land size did not exceed 6.5%, and yet they were given approximately 55% during the partition plan. And you could see all the way until today, at present day, where Palestinians live basically in Douglas camps, like South Africa. This is the Zionist tactic. But even when we look at the two attempts to seize more land in 56 and in 67, it was always the plan to get as much land and then try to create as a mixed imperative facts on the ground. And today, here's again a couple of quotes from Menachem Begin to Moshe Dayan about who started the wars and what was the real aim of these fights in order to grab more land. The next one, which feeds into this one, is to create facts on the ground. This is a geopolitical term that imposes a situation in reality as opposed to an abstract. But here, the Zionist movement has used this for over a century in order to obtain gradual and full control over all of Palestine as well as other territories, as we see today in the Golden, in the Golden Heights and the Shabbat Farms. Here is uh, the facts on the ground in the West Bank, hundreds of settlements, where you have today over 800,000 settlers colonial settlers inside what was supposed to be Palestinian land. Here is another view of it. And here you could see how it is totally isolated, where you have the areas A, B, and C in the Oslo Accord, where Palestinians basically have been confined to prison camps and prison cities. The fifth strategic imperative of this state is to create a garrison state. Ever since its establishment, Israel created a military-based society where the strategic, uh, it's a strategic imperative is that security and survival are paramount. Most crucial decisions are based on military measures and they take precedence over all else. The military budget is the highest in the world. Excludes Saudi Arabia because it doesn't count. But aside from that, Israel is almost $2,000 per capita year in and year out. In Israeli society, where you have about 6.5 million Jews, about half of them serve or are fit to serve in the army, and at any one point, about 10% of the population, 650,000, are in active duty or on reserve. That's the very definition of the garrison state. The next strategic imperative is developing a military doctrine of using overwhelming force to win against any and all enemies and to maintain what they call the military edge over all rivals. These are some of the military doctors that are used. They cannot have, at least to, to fight in enemy territories, but they can have long wars. They must use overwhelming force, employ all means, and so on and so forth. And we could see it as being used all the time. Why do we study this? Because this is how we, once you know the, what you are facing, you know how to confront it. The next strategic imperative is to maintain monopoly over nuclear weapons. And that explains what's happening in the world today and what's been happening for the past few years vis-a-vis -vis Iran. 
is that they possess 200 to 400 nuclear weapons. It is not, she is not a signatory to the NPT treaty. And you could see at any attempt somebody is going to acquire this technology, they were bombed. Iraq in 81, consideration of bombing Pakistan back in 84, for different reasons didn't happen. Bombed Syria in 2007, and you see the obsession over Iran's nuclear program today. Strategic imperative A is to build the most efficient, sophisticated, and ruthless security apparatus that Professor Pepe explained the 150 over and 270,000 people who are experts in intelligence op uh, operations and that are needed to control the population in the territories, eliminate perceived threats or threats, and manipulate regional politics. This is part and parcel of what the region is fixing. The next imperative is linking tightly with an international power and benefactor, even if they have to serve as a client state. That started first with Britain during the mandate years, then briefly with Czechoslovakia, but also meant Russia and the Soviet Union at the time, and Germany briefly, France in the 50s and 60s, and since 73, the United States. And we can spend the whole hour talking about this relationship, where 44 views, the most deals the country has ever cast, were on behalf of Israel, went all the way from Nixon to Trump without any interruption. Every single US president vetoed a resolution that was going to condemn Israel for one act or another. In one of my articles, I list all these, explain that anything was being vetoed. It didn't matter, even if children and women were being massacred. Here is again a quote from Herzl, where from the very beginning of the Zionist movement didn't want to act as being a, uh, a client state or a client movement on behalf of the colonialist power. Here he was arguing that the modern Jewish Palestine with a railroad from Jaffa to the Persian Gulf would resolve the difficulty of Britain. All the way to the first president, Hayim Weizmann, who was also arguing what a position would have been in the Near East if we had not provided in Palestine a foothold for Britain or England. Here is another quotation from a dangerous man who worked as a Israeli deputy national security advisor, Charles Friedrich, who is today a, an American academic. But he explains in his book how American support for Israel has for decades been the vital enabler of Israel. The next strategic imperative is that to keep world Jewry, especially in the US and Europe, Zionist, with unquestionable support for Israel. And we're going to have a few uh, presentations in this conference talking about these networks, from lobbying and, and funding and media and so on. The next strategic imperative, I have 12, so bear with me two more. Keep the enemy divided and weak. Fragment the Middle East and beyond. Keep the Palestinians divided in Gaza, West Bank, Jerusalem, Diaspora, and so on and so forth. The audit union plan that many people did not take seriously, but it's a very serious plan. I remember translating back in 84 a speech that uh, they, uh, Sharon gave in, at NATO during their summer uh, conference, where he gave the, uh, the keynote speech after he was forced to resign because of Saba Shatila. And uh, we didn't know what to call it, it was just a speech. We called it at the time the new map of the Middle East. It turned out that it was a blueprint what later is Ray Shahab uh, translated as the Odeh Dinan plan, which is word for the fragmentation of the Middle East. In order to maintain hegemony and ensure survival, Israel must be the strongest state in the area, region hegemon, because of the demographics and other reasons to become the region hegemon, where all other states must be broken up and fragmented on the basis of ethnic or sectarian lines. If you understand this, you would understand exactly what's happening in the Middle East today. Here is what it would look like. These states would be further fragmented. Libya, for instance, in that plan, in its entirety, would be four states. Look at what's happening in Libya today. Saudi Arabia is projected to be at least three states. And so is Iraq. And if you look at the, uh, the clean break 1996 document by these neocons, mostly Zionists, 
This is what they were planning for Iraq, and that's what happened, or they tried to happen in 2003. This is what they planned for Egypt and Sudan. And look at what's happening in Sudan, and look what happened a few years ago, where actually the current president of Sudan uh, was praising the Mossad officer as being the architect of so-called South Sudan independence. This is what they had before, and this is what they want after. And you could see how many states. They want basically 35 to 40 states. That's the only way they can maintain hegemony. The one on the right-hand side is the leader officer in, in, in Kurdistan. But this is, wasn't last year or the day before. This picture was taken in the 60s. That's how much far back they were hoping to get a Kurdistan state because it would be a state that could be controlled by Israel and hope. And this is what happened last year. The last one is become regional hegemon by aligning with minorities, separatists, despots, and tyrants, fighting popular, independent, and democratic movements from Nasser in the 50s and 60s to the Shah of Iran in the 70s to the Maronites in Lebanon in the 80s to the Arab Springs more recently. You can see Israeli hands. So what about the end of the conflict? Just give me a few more minutes here. <laughs> Israel always had a choice, but they don't want to make it, or they made the choice that they want, which would not solve the conflict. They had to choose two things out of three. Being Jewish, acquire the land, or be democratic. Taking the Jewish and democracy would, proceed, would produce what is called the two-state solution, which is totally failed, as everybody knows. It's too late. Even John Kerry, an American uh, uh, Secretary of State, recognized this acknowledge this, as well as any uh, politician except Palestinian leadership. But every other uh, uh, leadership has already recognized that this is undoable. Land and democracy, that's one state. That means they have to give up the ethnocentric uh, feature of the state. But they've chosen basically maintain Jewishness and acquire the whole land, which ends up with apartheid. So, how could this happen? Because no one, the world is not going to stand to another apartheid regime. <laughs> How can this conflict end? Well, we've presented 12, at least 12, uh, strategic imperatives. The inoperability of some of these or most of these strategic imperatives will kill the project. And you can try to go back and recall them. Change in the international power structure. These states that they rely on are not going to be there forever. Or change of the regional power structure. We saw that in the Arab Strait. How the whole dynamics of the region has changed. And how Israel kept silent and basically afraid that these things are going to uh, affect the Zionist project. Or crumbling internal dynamics or inherent weaknesses. There is a good studies on this that you can find many, many fault lines, Arab versus Jewry, there's secular, rich versus poor, Ashkenazi versus Israeli, urban versus secular. There's so many uh, fault lines and weaknesses within society that could crumble it. And worldwide solidarity movement to end Israeli apartheid is the biggest threat, as also our two speakers uh, have presented. So the end goal must be for us is to dismantle the whole Zionist project theory. Anything else is just a waste of time. It's systems and institutions because it's threat, it's dangerous to everybody. Worldwide solidarity movement to support justice and restore rights for the Palestinian, for the Palestinians who are the primary victims of Zionism. The only reason that this cause is alive today is because the victim did not die. They insist to resist. But keep in mind that this is not about Judaism. This is about Zionism. And our quest for this is to save Judaism from Zionism. Here is a map of the Muslim world. Jews can live anywhere. If they are not welcome in Europe, they can live anywhere from Tanja to Jakarta, from the far east to the far west. They do not have to be just huddled in Palestine at the expense of Palestinians' rights. They can go anywhere, and they are more than welcome. The world remembers Palestine. It's the only cause today. The only cause today that everybody remembers. I cannot remember any other cause. Here is Tunisia. 
Here's Egypt, in Tahrir. Libya, Syria, Bahrain, Morocco, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Algeria, Tunay, Pakistan, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Chile, London, Washington, South Africa, where the quotations by Mandela, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Turkey, by the hundreds of thousands last year, and the March of Return. The March of Return, which we will see one day when Palestinians go back to their homes. This is what Theodore Herzog said at the end of the First Zionist Congress in 1897. Today, I created the Jewish state, if not in five years, certainly in 50. Today, we say to him and his followers, you did not create the Jewish state. You created the monster, and the world will put an end to this monster. International law deals with uh, state policies, uh, with human rights, that is true, but it doesn't deal with the ideology of states. Uh, and uh, the struggle, as uh, Dr. Ariane pointed out, the struggle is not against the policy of the state or the strategy of the state, but the very ideology of the state. The international law doesn't have tools to deal with ideology of states. So what we need is a struggle from within and a struggle from the outside in order to bring down a regime. Uh, international law never broke down a regime. And I think, therefore, uh, if we accept this analysis, that the problem is the ideology uh, and not the strategy and not the policy, and we don't think that maybe we can limit the strategy and the policy by ideas such as partition, if we accept that this is the issue, I think that therefore, then we can at least point to a real target, a real end game that we are all aspiring to, and create a movement on the ground and outside that adapts itself to the, this reality in the 21st century. And this requires a lot of uh, uh, work on the Palestinian side for unity, we all talked about it. It requires finding the formula of moving from uh, boycott to sanctions, as happened in the case of South Africa, when it moved from societies to the corridors of power. Uh, and I think eventually we can also work from inside the Jewish society towards uh, a campaign that Dr. Ariane pointed out to convince them that Zionism is bad for them as well, not just for the Palestinians. These all ideas are not sound bites. 
programs. They are not slogans. They can be translated into real programs, real modes of action, planning of action. The rep people who represent today us are not busy with these plannings, are not busy with translating uh, these ideas into action. So I think we have to do it ourselves because nobody else would do it. Thank you so much. society on what goods were coming from South Africa. I uh, used to have, uh, my mother uh, went into exile and was living in the United Kingdom. And uh, she would spend her days in every day on a shop that brought uh, South African fresh produce. And she would conscientize society that do not buy these goods, they come from the apartheid regime of South Africa. And slowly, we began winning citizens in the UK. You would know that uh, the Margaret Thatcher regime was against our struggle for liberation. They called for Madiba's head and that of all political prisoners that they should be hanged. Uh, it was ironic to us uh, of recent, uh, when we were celebrating Madiba's centenary to have the Prime Minister Theresa May visiting Robben Island and weeping, crying uh, uh, her eyes out. And we say, what irony is this when you know very well you are in the forefront in the Macrofetra regime calling for Madiba's hand, the head to be hand. So we want to say to the Palestinians and activists all over, ensure you conscientize the society on every good coming out of Israel into your market. Let us boycott every product and ensure that uh, we are not uh, adding to Israeli's economy in ensuring that uh, they are able to oppress further the Palestinians. And I think in that regard, we will begin winning grounds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sami, as you know, uh, many Arab regimes were claiming strategy of confrontation for Israel, against Israel, in fact, in order maybe to gain such kind of legitimacy from the local peoples. But nowadays we can notice that uh, a, lot of a lot of things have been changed, in fact. 
Many Arab and Muslim regimes and sometimes top elites, they are claiming that the, the, we have already a lot of local problems. We have uh, difficulties and hardships regarding economy and democracy and all of these issues. So let's now ignore the issue of the Palestinian cause. Let's focus on our local issues in order to have the capacity to deal with this issue. And later on, when we have a very good and stable states, we can really think about the Palestinian cause. So what do you think about this scenario? Palestine was always for these Arab regimes the way to get legitimacy because they could never get legitimacy through democratic means, through elections, through trying to gain the support and love of their people. So they always used Palestine as a way to legitimize their regimes and of course in most cases uh, it failed because they never really uh, seriously thought about contracting design's project as such even though they had hot rhetoric and we could go over different examples. What we see today is that after the Arab Spring, we could see that uh, these uh, regimes have been exposed, that not only they uh, are not going to give their people the ability to express themselves, they will actually work against uh, uh, anything that they call for, including the, the previous slogans that they used to have, and today we see that they, they, especially in certain regimes, they align themselves very closely to Israel. I mean, we, we practically have today an alliance in the Arab world where Israeli interests and some of these Arab regimes' interests have coincided and they become so close that they coordinate on all means. And what, who is the enemy? I mean, supposedly it's Iran, because uh, Israel today considers Iran as being the, the biggest uh, uh, competitor or at least the biggest threat as they see it. But to the other Arab regimes, they could care less mostly about Palestinian rights or about Palestinian aspirations. What they call, what they, what they uh, care about is to consolidate their power and to keep themselves in power. That's what, what motivates them. And uh, they think that because Israel has a very close relationship with the United States, by becoming closer to the United States, they also can gain uh, that support. And of course, Trump has uh, shown that over and over again, you know, Obama had some some hesitations. He, he was uh, sometimes not agreeing with that. At any rate, what we see today, obviously, is are regimes who have no legitimacy, not on Palestine or anything else. Uh, they do not value uh, their people. They actually uh, uh, they they persecute uh, their people to the point where we see today in, in certain regimes uh, that most of the intellectuals are no longer in the country. Most of the people who actually can contribute to the advancement and progress of their communities of their countries are no longer there. So I, I expect that this is not going to be uh, to stay for a long time. We see it now in, in Algeria and Sudan, but I think this will also uh, uh, spread uh, throughout. I think we are going to get a new generation. You know, it's very difficult to get two revolutions or two major changes uh, in one generation, but I think within a few years this is going to expand and we're going to find completely different dynamics. Thank you so much, Mr. Sani. So, now let's go to the questions from the audience and we still have 25 to 30 minutes, so please make your questions rapid and short and please also introduce yourself. Let's start from here and from lady, yeah, could you just pass the microphone to the second round here? San Francisco State University. Uh, thank you so much for organizing the conference and for a very strong opening uh, grounding. I have very short three questions for each of the speakers. For Ilan Pape, uh, you mentioned in the last uh, the work of the, the Palestinian scholars, and I think you're referring to the settler colonial uh, studies. But in, in Arabic, there has been a lot of uh, theorizing in the Palestinian movement, the Palestinian resistance movement. Actually, that did describe Israel, classify it. So if you can just maybe come from my own head to uh, contrast the whole question of the discourse in Arabic and the discourse in English in the academic language that's seen as more valuable. For Chief Mandela, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about South African uh, quote-unquote foreign policy and what could we expect after the elections this coming month in South Africa? How do you see it? 
And for Dr. El Haryan, I'm wondering about you talked about 30 to 45 Arab states and so on. We, yet we know that all the borders are colonial borders that have been constructed. Then you also talk, talked about um, there are many places in the Muslim world where Jews could go. So I'm just wondering, there is a proposal that's floating around about one secular democratic state, one, se one state. Some of, well, some of it was proposed by the PLO back in 1968 charter, but it's been revived again today by multiple people and so on. And I'm not stuck on the secular aspect. I'm talking about the state. What do you think about that? And what do you think theoretically and intellectually about the question of borders? And are we, while we are trying to think about how to liberate Palestine, are we also reifying the colonial borders that have been designed by colonial powers in the region? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lebo. Um, please, let's go to the gentleman now. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Saeed al Hijda. Um, I'm an academic from the Najat National University in Nablus, Palestine, occupied Palestine. Um, I teach uh, geography, political geography. Uh, today is April 27, and 37 years ago, on April 27, 1982, I was machine gunned in a student demonstration in the city of old city of Nablus. I was severely injured in my chest, in my abdomen, in my leg. I almost died. Miraculously survived. Then I was in jail, and I was tortured. I was whipped by the only democracy in the Middle East, as they used to say. And um, the one who shot me was Jewish. The one who tortured me in jail was Jewish. The one who actually, as I said, my mother is Jewish. I did not know the difference between Zionist and Jewish until I went to the United States to study in 1984. And this brings me to the comment by the speakers, our distinguished speakers. Um, uh, Professor Ilan Pepe, you mentioned that there's no international mechanism to combat state, state, you state, but not ideologies. But actually, I would like to differ slightly with you, because in 1974, the UN General Assembly took a decision equating apartheid to be a crime against humanity. And based on that resolution, the international community imposed sanctions on South Africa because uh, uh, apartheid is a crime against humanity. And what's happening in Palestine is an apartheid, therefore it's a crime against humanity, and international law is not static. We should effect a resolution to impose sanctions on South Africa. And if you remember, there was a resolution equating Zionism with racism that was repealed. There was no mechanism for repealing, but George Bush, the father, and then the son of not so Holy Spirit, repealed it. And we need to reintroduce it. Because Zionism is racism, it's fascism, it's terrorism. And this it brings me to the last thing, what we, uh, as Sheik Mandela said, and our professor Samir Ariyan, how to end this. Because we're not only interested in pointing fingers and who's worse and who's not. We need to end this endless crime, embodied in the Zionist, settler colonial, fascist apartheid. And I suggest that, yes, we are not against Jews. We are not against Jews, we are against Zionism. And we need here to effect an international coalition, like we did in South Africa, to continue the fight, to dismantle it and replace it with a secular, democratic Palestine for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, uh, my name is the Reverend Wendy Hoff. I'm actually a priest, an Anglican priest, and uh, I have a church where I did until recently in North Cyprus, Turkish controlled Cyprus. It's, I'm really honoured to be here. People I've read, uh, Professor Pape and others um, widely, but haven't had the wonderful opportunity to meet you until today. I've been, uh, in my words, I tend to say to people, I'm passionate about Palestine, and you look at my Facebook page and there's no doubt about that. And I've been involved in activism on behalf of justice with peace in Palestine for about eight years now. Many Palestinian friends. I wonder if I could really give a comment to begin with rather than a question. Um, and my more academic friends have been very focused and asked each of our speakers. 
from a Christian faith background, clearly the, the significance of Jerusalem or of this land is also very important, regardless of which faith group we belong to um, or none. It is apartheid. I'm a very, very pro, very active supporter of BDS, for example. I've just come back from the West Bank, and actually, I'm more disheartened after this last two weeks. It was Christian Easter, and I went to uh, share that with some of my Palestinian friends. And I think that's due to the last election, and um, there was a sense of some NGOs that I work with, uh, prominent Palestinian lawyers. Um, uh, Dr. Sami Awad, who is the, uh, the, the uh, executive director of Holy Land Trust, who works a lot with conflict resolution. A lot of these groups who just not quite feel games over, please, I don't want to have put a downer on the wonderfully uplifting uh, speeches you've given us so far and presentations. But I think there's a huge elephant in the room so far, if you don't mind me saying so. My concern, or my main focus, as a priest and a theologian has been a, a Christian Zionism, which is an abhorrent in my eyes, if people know what I mean by Christian Zionism. We talked about Zionism, Jewish Zionism, or secular Zionism that has taken root, but the so-called theology, I don't call it an theology, a theology, it's a perversion, I believe, of thought, where swathed huge, huge numbers of particularly Americans, but it's prevalent in throughout the West and throughout Africa, who all blindly support the state of Israel because they are so brainwashed by this idea of Jewish people returning to, um, in the horrible words of John Hagee, excuse me, God's got a piece of real estate. I just think the huge huge propaganda machine that we are up against must be recognized um, and understood. And if I may just add, a couple of things really disheartened me in this past visit. I visited Nazareth. I've never been up there for the Sorry first... Sorry for interrupting, but could you conclude in a one sentence or something? Yeah, the propaganda machine. The propaganda machine that has taken over the minds and the hearts of Palestinians, as well as the wider world. And how do we address that? In addition, I will just add, Palestinian leadership, we talk about leadership, um, we, Nelson Mandela arose, we, we had figures who, who attracted an awful lot of affection worldwide. We need a figure like that for Palestine, sure, somehow. Thank you. Thank Professor Papé, could you please elaborate on, on, on the necessity of uh, um, swifting uh, uh, when it comes to wording and framing the debate? Because we are fighting on, on the rhetoric uh, and semantic uh, battlefield. So you, uh, you already mentioned that in interviews. So I, I believe it's really important to, to, I mean, to create new tools, new, new instruments to, to debate and to, to challenge Zionism in general and Israel in particular, uh, and not uh, not let uh, the mainstream uh, Zionist um, uh, narrative. Uh, I mean, the the, the um, uh, propagandist. Uh, not to let them uh, control the narrative, because they, uh, and, and this is the first question and from to to Mr. Mandela. Uh, how can we explain? Uh, how can we understand the, the the South African maintaining uh, diplomatic ties, even if they get down the ground a bit, but it's still still operating? How can we explain that? How can we understand that? Okay, thank you. Please to the lady in the third row. Um, please. Okay. I will, okay, I will come back to you in the next 
person. This is the lady in the third row. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أنسام أبو عودة من فلسطين وغزة بالتحديد سؤالي أولا أحييكم جميعا ضيوفنا الكرام ضيوف فلسطين ضيوف يعني القضية الفلسطينية بارك الله فيكم جميعا سؤالي يخص الشباب بالتحديد أو الشباب الفلسطيني وهي الفقرة أو عماد هذه يعني عماد القضية الفلسطينية بشبابها إذا انهدم هذا العماد ضاعت القضية الفلسطينية اليوم نواجه نحن شباب من شباب القضية الفلسطينية نواجه هجرة غير مسبوقة سواء في غزة في فلسطين في الداخل لخارج فلسطين الكل يعلم بأن هناك فقر وحصار وإرهاب وحروب ونريد أن نعيش بسلام نريد أن نرى نبحث عن مستقبلنا هذه المؤتمرات وهذه القضايا للأسف يعني أو التي يتعاملونها كلها جهود مباركة لكم لكن ما ما ينقص هذا الشيء أنها تنتهي في انتهاء فعالية المؤتمر ماذا ستقدمون للشباب الفلسطيني بعد هذه المؤتمرات أنا منذ أربع شهور وصلت إلى إسطنبول حضرت ما يقارب أو أكثر من سبع مؤتمرات تخص القضية الفلسطينية لكنها تنتهي في انتهاء فعالية And then we'll take a question from Junaid. Thank you to the speakers for their contribution. My name is Hanan Aruli, Palestinian living in Lebanon right now in States. Uh, my, my general question to the three speakers, I don't want to make any particular one because this is more, more enlightening, more another taking this debate into another direction regarding what is happening in the region. I we understand that the Israeli oppression operators today has never been as, as powerful as it was in the history. But at the same time, Dr. Alan Pelley, there are challenges facing the Israel controlling the Palestinians and the region because their project is going beyond Palestine. They have challenges. And the world has been changing also. And I would like to hear your perspective on the changing. There is a resistance movement, not only in the civil society, but there is a new resistance in terms of new uh, power emerging in the region in response to this increasing oppression of the Palestinian envoy. So I would like to have uh, some, to talk a bit more about what is happening around Israel. And that's why, if I want to give an example, how Israel is losing its ability to, re to respond by, with violence. For example, the latest rockets launched from Gaza towards Israel. Israel did refrain from responding, although they can. And in the history, they, ha they used a very brutal way of responding or even attacking. But Israel is going also through weaknesses, internal weaknesses, that they cannot even take it out to public, but there is fear inter internally in Israel. This is one dimension that we, we need to look at because what is happening in the world is also impacting us and maybe uh, an opportunity for the Palestinian a new movement to raise up and pr introduce a new strategy of liberation. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Hannah. So, uh, okay, so let's go. Thank you. Um, no, thank you very much. I think that this was a very powerful setup for a, inshallah, a wonderful conference ahead. Uh, just two questions, one uh, to Dr. Ilan Pate and um, one to Dr. Al Aryan. Um, I liked the way that uh, Dr. Pate effectively framed the issue as Israel as a separate colonial state. And that, that is the, the model through which we look at uh, how it has operated. And when, when uh, he spoke about recent scholarship on this, um, we also can go back to someone like Maxime Brodenson and his work on Israel as a settler colonial state. Uh, and it's interesting then to look at the, the various models that have existed. And that's what I was thinking about when you were talking about this in order to figure out, okay, what do we do with what we have in this model? So whether it's uh, the one model of the American settler colonial state, which is extermination. You have the model of South Africa, 
the minority population, exploiting a majority, which eventually it's anticipated that the majority will overthrow the minority. But in this situation, as you pointed out, we now have a, a situation which is roughly 50-50, uh, the population, and so the, the balance of forces uh, don't seem that good for the Palestinians, in addition to the Zionist state being supported by the world superpower and so on. So I wanted to, you to comment a little bit more on that. Um, as for Dr. Alarian, um, I think you uh, did a great job in, in talking about how the, the geopolitics of the Arab uh, countries right now is, is, is in a mess, and, uh, but, but there's hope there. Uh, and, but I also think that what needs to be emphasized is that what has ha happened around uh, the Middle East and Palestine uh, for the, since uh, the past half century has not just involved uh, Arab nations, and of course you mentioned Iran, but in addition to Iran, we're also talking about countries like Turkey and countries like Pakistan, crucial in the Cold War framework in enabling the Zionist configuration of power in the Middle East. They lost, quote unquote, lost Iran in 79, and now Turkey and Pakistan are becoming increasingly unpredictable. And I think this is why you see the drive right now uh, in, uh, by Israel to increase its cooperation with India because of the fear of Pakistan. And when you were speaking of the, the neocons and all of these uh, think tanks in D.C. drawing up these maps to redraw uh, these, uh, these countries, the, the, the main country they were targeting, targeting, if you look at it, was Pakistan. It was very clear. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm just finishing my point. So I'm saying that in terms of geopolitics, I think that we have to take these countries very seriously in the long-term uh, struggle for the liberation of Palestine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Mrs. Rawan Dhawan. And we will be taking more, just one question after Mr. Rawan. So. I didn't notice somebody from here. Okay, we'll take questions from this side. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for CIJA and Dr. Alarian for making us all of us in one room. That's in, in itself an incredible effort. My question to Dr. Papaya is if you can shed two sentences, some light on the militarization of the educational, educational institutions. Many of us academics and students here would be interested to know how exactly military and education in Israel works. Thank you very much. Thank you. From this side, any question? Um, okay, so the person back here. Thank you. Okay, my question first to Dr. Samuel Arian. Um, how, how, you know, uh, Chief Mandela on a couple of occasions in the past has stressed on the importance of unity of the Palestinians. How can the Palestinians lead beyond the divisions uh, that are holding them back between Hamas and Fatah in particular? And uh, how can the Palestinian society deal with this issue in the very near future? And is it through um, standing with one against the other or, with, or through going beyond the two of them and coming up with something new? My question to Chief Mandela is how efficient uh, or how central actually was the uh, Freedom Charter in the South African struggle against apartheid? And would you uh, think that something similar, something like the National Palestinian Covenant um, or a renewal of it would be something important for the Palestinians and their struggle. And my question to Dr. Ilan Tate, how efficient are the, um, the new Jewish organizations that are standing with BDS and Palestinian rights in the USA? Are they, uh, do, you, do you see uh, a future for them in uh, affecting uh, lobbying, affecting decisions in Congress and in media? Thank you so much. Now, let's go back to the speakers. Uh, within four minutes, we can answer the question. Or we can... <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, yes, I'll be as quick as I can. And uh, 
Let me start with settler colonialism. You a very good uh, question. Um, I think there are two main differences, of course, the whole lecture. Because every question here is a whole lecture. You have to invite me to give a course here. Tomorrow I'll answer some of it. Uh, colonialism, I think there are two differences. Uh, one has to do with the fact that when settler colonialism was written about by Palestinians in the 60s and 70s, there was a correlation between the position of the political leadership and the analysis of the academic. The people who write today as Palestinians write in total contradiction to the official position of anyone who claims to represent politically the Palestinians. It creates a far different kind of analysis. And secondly, I think that uh, the younger generation doesn't have, uh, for example, Abu Ammar's problem when he said, uh, we are not Red Indians. Namely, they don't see the native indigenous training of Palestinians as something which is degrading, but rather as something that uh, 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 frames correctly the Palestinian condition. But again, this is a whole lecture, uh, I cannot go uh, into it. Um, uh, the, um, is calling Israel an apartheid, uh, you know, enough for international law? Uh, yes, it is. You're right in many, many ways, but it, co it connects to the question about the new dictionary. Uh, um, that we are in a world that, after 70 years of Israeli propaganda, equating Israel with an apartheid state uh, is not going to go uh, to be easy and feasible to do it without a proper analysis and a change of dictionary. I, I, I will talk more, I'm not ignoring your question, it's part of my talk tomorrow morning, I hope you, you'll be here, because I, I'll talk a bit more about the need for framing a new dictionary. But you're absolutely right, this is, this is the kind of, the, the, the language that the so-called peace process created is the language uh, uh, of maintaining colonization. The language that we want to push forward is the language of decolonization, and we want to use this language in the 21st century. Very difficult to convince people that decolonization is still a relevant process, but I'll talk about it more uh, tomorrow. Uh, let me say something on militarization uh, of uh, Israeli uh, education. I think it's part of the apparatus I was talking about. Uh, the, the official educational system has to go through all the Israeli myths in order to create a sense of mission, of moral justification, of uh, certainty of orientation. Uh, this is connected to the last question of, uh, of whether the Israelis are even aware of a different kind of the youth movement in the Arab world that questions uh, the legitimacy, or even in the Jewish community uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the militarization is meant actually to create a soldier in the most brutal definition of a soldier. Someone who doesn't think but obeys orders. Someone who does not pay attention to his iPhone if the iPhone brings him information that can create a, a cognitive dissonance. So I think it's much more than just militarization. It's trying to create these soldiers, if you want, for the oppressive apparatus that I was talking about. But it's a whole, it's a whole lecture about Israeli militarization. Um, and um, let me say, I don't think uh, people are, uh, that Israel is invincible. If someone thought that they, they were talking about uh, if Israel is invincible and and cannot be, uh, uh, and doesn't have weaknesses, as someone has put it. Of course it is. The whole project, as I said, is based on the incompletion of the settler colonial movement, a uh, project. And the incompletion is first and foremost because of Palestinian resistance. That's the main reason that, that the project, it's not that the Israelis are not capable settler colonialists. They are very capable settler colonialists, but the Palestinian resistance disabled them to complete the mission. And therefore, uh, uh, most of the Israeli problems stem from their insistence on continue the ideology of settler colonialism, whereas the facts on the ground keep defeating this project on a small scale, but does not undermine it uh, altogether. And I will finish, and I, I, I apologize, I don't answer everything, because I, we don't have time, and the excellent questions which I I'm willing to answer afterwards, maybe personally, to people and tomorrow. I just want to say something about uh, uh, 
Uh, Christian Zionism that were mentioned here uh, in a broader context, but in a broader context. And I think that is very important because it answers a lot of the questions that we raised about our options to change the reality on the ground. Zionism, to begin with, was a Christian project, not a Jewish project. In 1820, Zionism was invented as an evangelical Christian idea. It's very important to understand it. In fact, it, it influenced the Jews of Europe to decide of Zionism as a territorial solution in Palestine. Not about the idea of the need to save Jews from anti-Semitism. That is not a Christian evangelical idea because they are anti-Semites. The, the idea of the Jews not to go to America, for instance, or not to seek uh, solutions elsewhere, have a lot to do with the influence of Christian Zionism in Israel. Christian Zionism is this double bill of anti-Semitism on the one hand, getting rid of all the Jews you don't want, and getting back the only Jew you want, Jesus Christ. And, and this is the idea of Christian Zionism. It's, it's, if the Jews return to Palestine, it precipitates the second coming of the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, the shish kababing of the disturbing, shish kababing of Jews if they don't convert to Judaism, and all is well. And it, it's a double bill because you also get rid of the Jews in your countries. This is why Zionism became such an attractive idea even today to Christian Zionists. And it is exactly what I think some of you said it. It's Zionism is a Jewish, it is a European issue. It's a purely European issue that has to be resolved not only on Palestine on the ground. We need to say to Europe, and with this I would end, you have not come to terms with what you did to the Jews in Europe. You have never come to terms. And the reason is that Israel allowed you to absolve yourself from the genocide that you committed in, in Europe. It is not surprising that the first state in the world that recognized Germany, West Germany, as a new state was the state of Israel. Because that was the deal. We don't deal with the anti-Semitism and we allow the Zionists to colonize Palestine. And this is why racism is still rampant in Europe it's now directed towards Muslim more than it is directed towards Jews, but anti-Semitism against Jews still exists, of course it does. And this is why the solution for me, for one democratic state in Palestine, is also a way of helping the Europeans finally to have a closure of a very ugly history, not only towards Jews, but towards minorities that they didn't like and didn't seem to them to fit the idea of what is European, what is Aryan, what is white, what is superior. And I think we should connect more directly to these discussions in Europe about racism and Islamophobia, the discussion on Zionism. Because I think this is part and parcel of the same issue of the West that created, and this is my criticism of international law, created supposedly universal set of values, but would these set of values were created when two-thirds of the world was still colonized and were never directed to the settler colonialist project of Australia, America, South America, South Africa, Algeria, and Palestine. They were always exempted from international law. Even in 1960, the international law tribunals did not include in colonialism one settler colonialist country. It's amazing. In 1960, not one settler colonialist country is mentioned in any international law document as violating international law by settler colonialism. Colonialist countries are mentioned, all of them are mentioned, and they are asked to leave the colonies of Africa and so on. But South Africa is not mentioned, because South Africa is not a colony. It is not a colony of Britain. So in 1960, nobody, I checked it. To be sure, last night I couldn't sleep and I couldn't find it. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I found the 1960 declaration. South Africa is not mentioned there as a violation of international law because it says it's not a maritime colony. It's an independent, sovereign state according to the Westphalian idea of a nation state. And therefore, we have no problem with South Africa. Israel enjoys the same unity today. 
We have to bring back settler colonialism as a crime against humanity, even if it gets us into trouble with Americans, Australians, and New Zealanders, who are very nice people, but we should talk to them as well about their own crimes against their own indigenous and aboriginals uh, and native people. Thank you. South Africa's foreign policy now and even beyond the upcoming elections. Our foreign policy has always been uh, informed about how any country globally, its attitude has been to our very own struggle for liberation. And I think my grandfather in an interview in the US put that clearly, that we judge any country as to what its attitude has been to our struggle for liberation. And therefore, we continue in that regard. This is why uh, we know as South Africans that during our struggle for liberation, Palestinians inspired the South African struggle for liberation. Madiba and many leaders that were incarcerated uh, to Robben Island for life drew support and inspiration from the Palestinians. And therefore, now that we are free, it is our onus is upon us to ensure that we continue to being the voice of the voiceless and continue to ensuring that we fight for the oppressed citizens around the world. So if you have uh, looked at our ANC uh, policy conference as well as the ANC's uh, national uh, uh, conference that we held last year in December, it's been very clear to us that uh, we want an immediate uh, downgrade of our uh, embassy in uh, Tel Aviv and in Israel. Uh, but some of us, and uh, including myself, are very clear on where we stand. We do not want even the downgrade. We are calling for a clear shutdown of economic and cultural ties with the apartheid state of Israel. But, you must therefore look at the process that uh, policies come out of the organization that in the African National Congress and then uh, are uh, uh, implemented uh, by government. And therefore government has its own bureaucracies and its own challenges in implementing. We have been very frustrated as uh, activists in South Africa in trying to push the foreign ministry in ensuring that the immediate downgrade is fulfilled. We are happy uh, now that uh, the Honorable Minister uh, Lindiwe Sisulu has uh, confirmed that uh, we are in the process of uh, implementing the immediate downgrade and we are recalling our ambassador. In response to that, uh, the Zionist uh, regime uh, of apartheid Israel has said that uh, they will remove the ambassador and who cares? Take your ambassador, we then have no recognition of you whatsoever. So, in that regard, we do hope that even post uh, our elections, we will continue exerting pressure on the uh, government of the Republic of South Africa to ensure that the will of the people is implemented. And uh, that is, the South Africans will forever stand on the side of the Palestinians uh, at large. Now, when you come to uh, the question that was posed on to uh, how can we end the apartheid Israel, we have to unite, and I speak uh, uh, consistently on the issue of unity. Divided, we cannot conquer. It is pivotal that every Palestinian regard themselves as the oppressed people. Shut your eyes out from political party lines, focus on who you are as a nation, as Palestinians that are oppressed by an apartheid Israeli regime and therefore unite because united you are able not only to look to your friends but to mobilize the world in its entirety. And therefore uh, looking externally, uh, we need to look at uh, what we can do in the various regions in, South, in Africa, in the southern region, in the other uh, regions within the continent, but also look at the international solidarity movement uh, across the globe. It is also important to focus on areas of strength. South Africa is now uh, sitting in the BRICS uh, countries. 
how can we mobilize and utilize South Africa to be the voice for the Palestinian struggle within the BRICS countries? How do we ensure that the BRICS countries are the champion for peace, justice, and human rights? And ensure that the, we exert an armed embargo on uh, apartheid Israel. But also, you look at uh, South Africa is now enjoying a seat in the Security Council. How do we ensure that seat is utilized to better the Palestinian struggle, but also the struggle of the voiceless uh, throughout the world? So I therefore think that uh, there is still a lot more we can do to mobilize support as activists, but also we need to align ourselves with governments that can ensure that sanctions are a reality, sanctions are exacted on Israel, and therefore that uh, uh, is one of the uh, achievements that uh, uh, we seek uh, over the uh, coming months and years ahead of us. But then there was another question stated of where uh, we need a Nelson Mandela in Palestine. We've always said that uh, there's one Nelson Mandela. He was brought up within a collective leadership in South Africa, and uh, he became the face and the voice of the struggle for liberation. But amongst him, there are ordinary men and women that even sacrificed more than he did. Because in his own testament, he said there are those that bled and died for the struggle for liberation. And therefore, for Palestine, we do not need a Nelson Mandela. We need ordinary men and women and children to pick up the bait in where he left off, charge forward, and ensure that we, really, we realize a free Palestine in our lifetimes. There was a question also speaking on uh, the... Uh, South Africa's uh, maintaining uh, diplomatic ties with Israel. I think uh, at a government level, as also as a party level, you have to uh, separate the two issues. We are clear within the African National Congress that Israel is no friend of South Africa. And therefore, South Africans know that we enjoy this freedom today because of uh, the support that we had from the Palestinian uh, uh, people. And in that uh, 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 note, the onus is now on us to ensure that we retain the support that we enjoyed during our darkest days for struggle for liberation. And therefore, that is why we continuously exert pressure on our government to remove itself in terms of any links that it ties uh, itself uh, with apartheid Israel. And, and another speaker spoke of uh, once the conference is over, what happens? Because usually we have these conferences and nothing happens beyond that. There has to be something that happens beyond this. We gather in moments like this to think, to recollect our thoughts, and to strategize and map the way forward. Once we go beyond these walls, we are to ensure that we are the voice of the voiceless. We continue to lobby, we continue to engage, we continue winning the numbers, we continue convincing the disbelievers that Israel is indeed an apartheid state. And if apartheid is denounced as an international crime, then we should be able to class it uh, uh, as such and ensure that uh, this work is never within conferences and it ends there, but translates to our daily uh, lives. The division within the Palestinians, I must tell you that uh, sitting in South Africa, this is our biggest concern that uh, we have. Uh, during our own struggle for liberation, uh, many people today view the victorious African National Congress as to have been the liberator. But I can assure you, from where we have come from that it was not just the African National Congress that paved the way for the struggle for liberation. There is the likes of the Natal Indian Congress, the Transvaal Indian Congress, the Colored People uh, Congress, that were the subscribers to the Freedom Charter that was drafted in the early uh, 50s, and ensuring that uh, this document became what South Africans as the oppressed people viewed to be a future South Africa. And therefore, this is a document that binded us all as the oppressed South Africans
to fight for a free and liberated democratic society. And in so saying, it is very important that uh, the Palestinians are able to unite themselves within one document that they can uphold and say, this is a future dream we have of a free Palestine, and therefore work towards the implementation of that. Without the uh, Freedom Charter, South Africa, uh, South Africans at large would have never been united across racial boundaries as well as across gender uh, 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 differences. And it has been important for us uh, to utilize the Freedom Charter in realizing our freedom. Thank you. There, I have four questions which I'll try to answer very quickly. The first question is about the one secure democratic state. Obviously, this will, for the large part, probably uh, do away with the Zionist exclusivist state. Obviously, there's a big if here, whether the, the Zionist, the Jewish Zionist, and the Christian Zionist would allow this to take place. But it would definitely deal with that problem, and it would have an immediate benefit and solution. But yet, uh, a bigger problem does not, it would not solve, which is the problem of borders and the problem of the nation-state system across the, the, the Middle East and, and the, the, the wider Muslim world, which is a problem that a lot of people are talking about, and that they, uh, uh, it, has, it was uh, abundantly clear during the, the uh, Arab Spring movement is that these boundaries were creating problems more than anything else, and that when you have these tyrannic uh, authoritarian regimes, it becomes uh, easy for them to control these small uh, countries as well as the, the resistance movement. At any rate, it is a, a bigger problem that has to be dealt with, the problem of nationalism at large and borders. But the, uh, the, the bigger, uh, if I have to look at it from a, a, a wider point of view, which is the question that we talked about today in this panel, the, you know, the, the, the racist Europe and how they're dealing with the Jews. Uh, uh, Palestine may not be enough. I don't know if it could be enough. Could be, could be not. And therefore, if we have six or eight million Jews who cannot stay in Palestine, and Europe doesn't want them, we're saying they can stay anywhere. It doesn't have to be just, you know, that they should be welcome. I mean, that is our tradition. This is this is what our culture calls for, this is what our history calls for. It should be open, and borders should not be the problem. If uh, Moroccan Jews want to go to Morocco, by all means, Iraqi Jews back to Iraq, and they should be welcome, and Yemeni Jews back to Yemen. Yemen. Now, it's, 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 it's a big mess, but what I'm trying to say here is that they should be able to do that. The problem is that they cannot take people's possessions and people's lands uh, by force and expect, no, okay, let's get along now. No, you can't get along until rights are restored. But in terms of your rights as a human being, as a person who needs to be protected and he needs to be free and respected and all that, we should all call for that and could not confuse the two. The problem, because we are sometimes too much bucked down with, uh, with, with too many wrongs happen, is that we want to fix a wrong with another wrong, and that we should not be allowed. So we may solve a problem, but create another. And I think we should always look at the big picture. And the big picture here is that uh, whatever system is uh, evolved in Palestine, uh, as long as it has these standards, you know, racism is unacceptable, freedom, justice, truth, and so on. Uh, the issue of geopolitics. Uh, obviously, I didn't have enough time to talk about this, but certainly there is an alignment between Israel and the United States on these issues. The United States, one of its imperatives is never to allow any emerging state in the Arabian area to expand beyond its intended influence or to become stronger or outside control. And Israel has basically adopted the same principle but in its own region. So when it comes to Turkey and, and Pakistan and these areas, once they go beyond certain islands, they do collide, they do, uh, they, there's an realignment of, of, of sorts between the, the both. That's why you find uh, India or Israel closer to India today, for instance, because Israel could look at Pakistan as a potential uh, power against it because of whatever uh, cultural and other means, and the same thing with, with Turkey. So yes, obviously there is a, a, an element there. The issue of unity of Palestinians. 
the question from back there. The problem here is there is a lack of national project. There is a lack of national strategy. So all what they fight about is bits and pieces, which does not really add much to the resistance part of it. Obviously, you know, when, when, when the Palestinian National Authority says that I would like to control the, the arms and the resistance, I mean, no one's going to do that. This is by itself a self-defeating mechanism that there is no seriousness here about engaging. At the same time, you don't, you know, people are not going to come and, and, and give up the, 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 the strength because you want to control. But it's, it's beyond just simply Fatah and Hamas. Within Fatah itself, you have different trends. I don't think they even have a national project. I think they have different groups within themselves. And they cannot even articulate what exactly they want. The, two, the problem is they gambled and they lost. They gambled big and they lost big. Now, to, 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 to tell the people, you know, we took you on this ride of 25 years that were totally failures, the response of the people then set aside. You are failing. But they will never admit that. So they start bringing problems as if that the other side who did not accept this path is, 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 is the reason for it. Why everybody knows what the reason is. The failure was all over the place. The Zionists will never allow the emergence of Palestinian state. Not two states, not three states, not ten states. Bundo stands, yes, but that project existed in 71. And the Palestinians were laughing at it. So uh, I, I don't think we have the the the, the uh, the regional dynamics that would allow for one party to overcome the other. So have we still living under the auspices of the Arab Spring? I think uh, the Palestinian National Authority would have withdrawn and would have tried to find a connection. But since we're not in that era, we're in the era of the deal of the century, we're in the era of imposing solutions, we're in the era of curtailing back uh, Islamic resistance movements and Iran and all that, then what they have to do is you need to, to, uh, to uh, as much as possible, absorb what you have until a better dynamics takes place. Uh, as far as the, the Palestinian people themselves, they're under occupation. They cannot resolve this issue. We cannot go to elections. All the thing about elections is, 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 is a fantasy. It cannot happen. And who said only the people who are in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, even if they are given the chance, and they will never be given the chance ever, it's what one and, and everybody thinks about the big mistake, but what about the other six million people outside? Why can't they have any kind of say in their future? Why are they totally excluded? I think Dr. Abusito will probably address that in other things. I think these issues anyway, Hani and Rabbi uh, and, 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 and Rabab and others, and they will talk in, you know, at, at length to address these issues. On the final things about Christian Zionism, which I, it's, it's a huge problem, I think it's even in, in some respects more problematic than, than Zionism itself, because it involves uh, it involves superpowers, it involves people who are within superpowers to control policy, and that means that we really have to engage Christians who are not Zionists. They are the Christians who are not Zionists are the ones who will defeat the Christians or the Zionists. And in my experience, you know, in the U.S., I, I found that to be very uh, very successful. Uh, because most people don't know much about this, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Most of them just hear from it, and, and they are told, and they get back. And I think times have changed, but that's the way it has been. And until we get churches who are not Zionists to care more about this conflict, because it's not in their name, the U.S. is making all these, uh, it's enabling Israel with all its criminality in the name of America. And the Americans have to get involved. They cannot just set aside and think, you know, I'm, I'm not involved in this. They are involved, whether they want it or not, whether they know it or not. So somehow we need to re-engage this segment, which is uh, substantial, in addition to the other justice issues, uh, justice action issues, uh, social action issues, and then we'll be able to obviously address this on a, on a wider scale. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ian Pape. Thank you, Ted Manja Mandela, and thank you, Dr. Sami. And thank you all for joining us in this session. It would be so appreciated if you fill up the surveys and give them to the volunteers in the interest of this call. And see you in the next session. Thank you so much, uh, Anani and our distinguished speakers, uh, for this really uh, enlightening session. I have one announcement, and then I need to give the momentos to our speakers before we just, 
uh, uh, we get our break. There is a sale upstairs by Palestinian students at ESO for the benefit of people in Gaza. So if you would like to uh, get some of these bake sales, please uh, help them and encourage them. Uh, I would like to give this moment to, to first Dr. Ilan Safay. We'll resume 25 minutes, 5 to 3. 